from the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street, right next to the High Museum of Art in Midtown Atlanta. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church. My name is Tony Sundermeyer, the senior pastor, and I want to thank you for watching today's broadcast. Now, I invite you to join in the worship of God.
Friends, good morning. My name is Rebecca Lamont, and I'm one of the pastors serving here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm so glad to welcome you to this time of worship, whether you're joining live on Sunday morning or tuning in later in the week. It's so good to stay connected in worship in this way. If you can take a moment and check in using our text platform, we would appreciate it. If you're a first time visitor, text the number one and ST, so first, to 313131. Or if you've checked in before, text the word check in, C H E C K I N to 313131. We'd like to be able to stay in touch, and if you're a visitor, to reach out directly to welcome you this week. A few announcements about things happening in our life. The FPC Women's Ministry invites you to join Morning Watch, which is a new Facebook Live devotional at 8.30 on Tuesday mornings. You can join the group to set the tone for your week and share prayer, reflection, and fellowship. We're also happy to be launching a box lunch concert series. The first will be Friday, September 18th at noon. This series is co-presented with our concerts at first and the Emory Chamber Music Society of Atlanta. It will be a live streamed concert featuring Beethoven violin and cello sonatas with several familiar musicians from our most recent chamber music concerts here. You can find it on our Concerts at First tab on the church website or on our Facebook page. A quick note of thanks to the broadcast and communications team who keep us going and keep these offerings available for our community, to our incredible musicians who come and sing each week and offer their gifts so that worship might be even better. Today, we welcome Jonathan Urizar on violin. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here and lending your gifts. And in the last couple of weeks, we've been able to have some lay leaders back in our worship space this morning. Our youth liturgist is my own son, James Lamont. Now let us turn our hearts and minds to the worship of our Lord. Please join me in the call to worship, printed in your digital bulletin. Lord, we come, for you, we come to you for understanding. Teach us your ways. Turn us away from vanity and selfishness. Show us your paths and help us walk in righteousness. Give us a whole new way of life. We open our whole hearts to you, O oh God. Amen.
scripture tells us that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us now confess our sins first together as a community and then in silence. God of love, we confess that we are committed to our own ways, defensive of our own opinions, obsessed with our own wants, and adamant about our own rightness. We are quick to love ourselves, but slow to love our neighbors as much. We are quick to forgive ourselves and even quicker to condemn others. Forgive us, Lord. Turn our hearts inside out. Help us to see you in every other person, your remarkable creation, your grace, and your love. Give us what we need to live as people on your way, walking toward wholeness for all. Restore us to energy and joy for the journey. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Glory to God, glory to God, glory in the highest, glory
Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. Hear now God's word. <clears throat> Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart by your decree, to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away from disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Hear again God's word for you and for me. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak through these old words a new lesson for us today, that we might go from this time to live new lives in you. Amen. Well, when everything moved to an online format in about mid-March, one of the things we added to our church life was a daily devotional. From March to August, members of the staff took turns writing, and we just looked at one of the lectionary texts for our assigned day. There wasn't an overarching theme, and we didn't coordinate or try to make them into a series. We just read the Bible for the day and shared our thoughts and prayers in those emails that you got each morning. We've had a lot of positive feedback about those devotionals. I think they helped us to stay connected as a church family. And I know I got emails that said things like, I've never really read that scripture before at all, or I've never heard it that way before. Some of my very most meaningful connections of this summer came after devotionals when something that had been on my heart was also on some of yours. I learned such cool new things. I learned where some of you are from, what music stirs your souls, what lessons you lear learned from your parents growing up. I learned about the Bible verses you had to memorize in your life, whether you liked it or not. And I even learned that some of your loved ones are buried in the historic cemetery near our home where the Lamans like to walk in the late afternoon sometimes. It's been a gift to connect with you as we read the Bible together. But I also had several emails over the course of those months asking me about the lectionary itself. This thing that we referred to, the lectionary texts for the devotionals or the texts for the morning that we use in sermons, People asked, what is this lectionary, and where do I find it, and how do I use it? So since we're lingering in the lectionary here for a season, and both of today's texts are from it, I want to take a moment to talk about it, and more importantly, to talk about how we read the Bible, why we read the Bible, 
and what we do with it. Because friends, God's word is alive and we need to hear what God has to say to us today. So the lectionary, that's short for Revised Common Lectionary, is really just a calendar of readings. It's a division of the Bible into smaller chunks, and they're assigned to different days on a three-year cycle. So if you really stuck with it and you read the texts for each day, you would read through almost the whole Bible, there are a few things that are not included, in about three years. There are readings assigned for weekdays, and there are readings for each Sunday. And with the wonders of the internet, you can have them sent to your email, or you can look them up and see all of the readings in one place. There's always a reading from the Old Testament, a reading from the Psalm that James just read, a reading from one of the Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and a reading from the rest of the New Testament, as with the Romans text I just read a minute ago. Now, we don't use the lectionary exclusively here at First Pres, but it's a tool to help us engage with our Holy Scriptures. And I find it to be a very helpful tool for a few reasons worth noting before we turn back to our psalm and to Romans. The first is that in a chaotic time, it roots us in the rhythm of our faith. We even get a different calendar the lectionary isn't organized by the calendar year or the school year or the fiscal year. So it doesn't start on January 1 or on July 1. It doesn't align with any other season, tax season, school season, election season, football season, flu season. It follows the liturgical year. It starts with the first Sunday of Advent. So we will flip to a new year with Advent because a new year for us as Christians comes with preparing and hoping for the coming of the Savior of the world. I don't know about y'all, but I need that reminder that the new year we're all longing for, especially in 2020, comes when we start getting ready for Jesus. This is good news in a year that has been so disordered and disrupted God is coming to reorder the world. Second, the lectionary helps us read more of the Bible. If we're left to our own devices, we tend to cherry pick the verses and the stories that are already familiar. So we'll go again and again to some parts of the Bible and not read other parts much at all. Sometimes it's because we just want to feel comforted by what we already know. Sometimes we're intimidated by texts that are harder to interpret and harder to understand and easier to avoid. And sometimes we just forget about some books. If you're honest, when was the last time you read Haggai or Obadiah? We do this with everything in our lives. We go with what we know. But when we follow an order of readings that we haven't chosen, we explore much more of our wide and complicated holy scriptures. And third, the format of the lectionary reminds us to start with God's word and to listen to what it says to us, rather than starting with what we think and going to the Bible to find a scripture that agrees. The main reason that I look to the lectionary for scriptures on any given day is to be surprised. If I decide before I open the Bible what I want to say or teach or preach, and then I go find a scripture that supports my argument, I close myself off from what God might be trying to say to me. Perhaps you've heard the terms eisegesis and exegesis sometime in a Bible study or in your reading. That's what I'm talking about here. Eisegesis means interpreting a text by reading our own ideas into it, while exegesis, with that prefix ex, meaning out, like exit, means drawing meaning out of a text. When we turn to Scripture with open minds, we're more likely to hear God's voice instead of our own reflected back. Sometimes we'll hear God's voice in books we don't often use. 
sometimes in stories that don't seem relevant to our context at first glance, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, those texts surprise us and teach us something new. When we start with our own agendas, we shut down the living part of living word. We make the Bible into something more like a database to be searched for supportive citations, or even worse, we make it into a tool to further our own agendas. That's nothing new. People have been using God's holy word for their own ends for centuries, and the year 2020 has been no exception. This year, if you've been listening, politicians and public figures and interest groups and preachers have put the Bible on the public stage. But when that happens, we have to heed the words of 1 John 4 that says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Friends, not everyone who claims to speak from this holy word has actually been changed by it. In a divided nation, in an election year, in the face of two pandemics of COVID-19 and racial injustice, we see more than ever that how we read the Bible matters. How we use the Bible matters. In the words of the great preacher, Barbara Brown Taylor, people of faith must beware those who cannot tell God's will from their own. The Bible is not a prop. It isn't a talking point to support a platform or a personality. It isn't a weapon we pull out to show that we're right. It isn't ours to manipulate to swap out the words we don't like and replace them with ones we do. It isn't background footage for sound bites or a menu of values that can be mixed and matched with those we like. The Bible is not a stump speech. Let me be clear, it doesn't belong to any political party or candidate or country. It is not and never has been politically expedient just the opposite. This holy word witnesses to God's order that exists over all of human politics and powers. It exists as a divine corrective to them. Both of our lectionary texts for today are reminding us that we read scripture to know and to follow God's way, not our own. Both of these texts give us guidance to order our lives even in chaotic times. So for most of this summer, the daily lectionary has moved carefully, really painstakingly through Psalm 119, bit by bit for 176 verses. I think we've been in this psalm for so long that two of my own devotionals were about parts of the same psalm. So when I saw that Psalm 119 was still our lectionary text for this morning, my first thought was, what else is there to say? We've already done this one this summer. It's still a long psalm about God's law. But as I tried to listen for the surprise it had for me, I realized that nothing could be more timely here in a summer of disruption. Nothing could be more helpful than to dwell for a really long time on a prayer that names the very things we've been thinking. Like the fact that God's ways are really different from the behavior we see around us. And the fact that we need God to keep showing us what's right and to help us do it. This psalm names a lot of the same chaos and disruption we're experiencing right now. Sickness, pain in our bodies, troubled minds, disorientation, especially when we're apart from each other, fear, feelings of powerlessness, violence, it's all in there. The psalmist describes being persecuted by powerful people and having falsehoods spread about him even before the internet. 
He laments because arrogant people are smearing him with lies. If we're listening, we can relate. We feel perplexed and sad and, and angry as we get more and more used to a culture of labeling and name calling and lies. And we get sad and angry and perplexed because we realize that we are drawn into that behavior too. I can't even count how many conversations I've been in where someone has lamented the fact that our public discourse has devolved into meanness and arguing. We seem unwilling to listen to each other. We've forgotten that we can hold differences without labeling someone our enemy. The psalmist is describing that same kind of chaos. And in the face of it, he prays to know and to follow God's law. He sees that those other things are false kinds of order, rooted in fear and holding power over others. So he praises God's law and he thanks God for giving it to us. But he also talks about how hard it is to follow especially when others are not. He comes back over and over again to ask God to keep him from falling into false ways. For 176 verses, he asks to follow God's way. So Psalm 119 is a perfectly timed word. The eight verses James just read remind us that we are not adrift. We have a guide that is older and stronger than the false forms of order we see in 2020. When everything feels chaotic, when we wonder whether every goodness and civility is lost and we don't know what to do in the face of just so much, we can do as the psalmist did. We can turn back to God's law and God's order. Teach me, O Lord, your way, and I will observe it. Give me understanding that I may keep your law with my whole heart. Lead me in your path, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and away from selfish gain. This is the law we seek. The Apostle Paul was also very concerned about the law. It's a prominent theme in his writings. And he was trying to instruct early Christians so that they could understand and live God's order through confusing times. They faced a lot of competing claims about law and what was required of them. So Paul turns them back to God's commands. And in the section of the letter to the Romans that I read a minute ago, Paul gets very concrete about what God's law means for how we treat each other. This applies both at a community level and person to person. And it's lovely in its simplicity and directness, really. Paul says that to fulfill God's law is to love. Love. The other commandments don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, etc., are summed up in this one, love your neighbor as yourself. That's pretty familiar ground for Christians, but it's timely here with a new message because Paul says two other important things about keeping God's law. First, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Let me say that again. Love does no wrong wrong. The kind of love Paul is talking about here isn't emotion. He isn't saying that we'll feel happy about the people in our lives who are difficult. He doesn't expect us to somehow feel affection to those who are belittling and labeling and calling names. He doesn't think we'll start liking those people or have warm fuzzies about the arrogant and the smearers because love isn't about a feeling. The love that fulfills God's law is an action, and it's a very specific kind. It's an action to promote the good of another. We might not want to hug our neighbor, much less our enemy, 
but we must still act to promote that neighbor's well-being. In fact, the other thing Paul says, it's something I've often overlooked in this text, is that we actually owe that kind of love as a debt to one another. Verse 8 says, owe no one anything except to love. I usually hear that as owe no one anything, full stop. And it just resonates as a good lesson in financial responsibility. Don't be in debt. But Paul is actually reminding us that according to God's law, we owe every other person a debt of love, a debt of taking action for their well-being. Love is their due in God's economy. Because in God's economy, we have received grace through the ultimate act of love. This debt of love is more than just charity, giving something away, giving money away. It's more than a random act of kindness. It's more than being friendly or not getting into arguments in the comment section on Facebook. Love is actively seeking what is good for our neighbor. There are a lot of ways that we define ourselves into groups right now, maybe even define who's our neighbor and who we don't think of as a neighbor. I think the time of pandemic and political polarization has highlighted these divisions. It's brought them into really sharp relief. But if we're honest, there are folks we see not just as different from us, but as threats to us. There are people whose stories we will not hear or accept as true. There are people who make us feel defensive and so we shut them down. There are those we've cast as enemy because we just have different opinions. Messages all around us tell us what to do with those people. We can avoid them. We can blame them because we think they're at fault. We can argue with them or try to convince them that we're right, or at least we can know who they are and label them with some group. Above all, we should make sure they don't gain any power. Do you hear this language around you in our culture today? It's us versus them kind of language. Have you heard sentences or maybe even said them yourself that start with something like, they always or they never or, well, what about what they did? Well, Romans 13 is reminding us that we owe each of those theys, each of those others, a debt of love because they are our neighbors. We don't have to feel lovey about those we see as enemy. In fact, we might never feel any differently than we do now. But loving our enemies means taking action for their good anyway. Our enemy's well-being is actually our responsibility. If we lived this command to act for someone else's good, our world would change. We would speak in ways that honor each other. We would take responsibility for the health and safety of our siblings in Christ. We would use our time and money and influence, not just for what we need and want, but to fulfill God's law. Love your neighbor. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Friends, in this disrupted, chaotic time, God still speaks. Sometimes through unexpected texts, sometimes in surprising ways, but always reminding us that God's order is not based on fear and violence and arrogance. God's law is love. That same love that came in the person of Jesus Christ to offer the ultimate act of sacrifice for our well-being and to reorder the world forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, as always, we give you thanks for a new day, an opportunity to be your people in the world. Your love and light are with us today as they are every day, and for that, we are ever grateful. Help us to share your love and light with the rest of your creation. We see so much pain, loss, and anger in the world and you call us to love and redemption and peace. Work through us so that we can help realize your kingdom among us. Today we come to you bearing the weight of this week. We come to you in grief, in mourning, in celebration, in stress, and in hope. Help us to know that you hold this weight with us. Each day brings something new, and you step with us through it all. For those of us in mourning, we pray for your compassionate presence. For those of us in stress, we ask for a sense of peace and ultimate understanding that in you, O oh God, we are enough. What we are doing is enough. For those of us in fear, help us to see your light around us. For those of us in celebration, we pray for creativity and imagination in this strange season. Holy God, be with us. Help us to know you so that we may better know one another. Help us to see you so that we may better see your image in each other. Recognizing the divine image in our neighbors, let us join our hearts and voices as we pray the prayer your son, Jesus the Christ, taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we are so grateful for your ongoing support and generosity in this season. With your help, we're able to continue caring for all those among us. You can give online at firstprezatl.org give. And during this time of offering, take a moment to extend the peace of Christ with a family member, a loved one, a friend. 
One way is to say, the peace of Christ be with you, and to respond, and also with you. Let us take the time now to offer our gifts to God in gratitude and in praise.
Let us pray. Holy God, use these our gifts to further the work of your kingdom, connecting, liberating, and sustaining us all. Help us to continue to build and shape systems within this church and within this world to share justice with all of your children. We pray all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. go from this time of worship listening for God's voice, listening for the comforting guidance God's order is to each of us. And as you go, go knowing that the peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ dwell in each of us this day and forever. Amen.
thank you for watching today's broadcast. For more video content, I'd encourage you to visit our website, firstpressatl.org. We'd love to see you here sometime at the corner of 16th and Peachtree Street to join us for worship. Thanks again for watching.